Hi class and welcome to the first screencast in our new unit on molecular genetics. So we're going to extend what we've learned in genetics and now we're going to really dive in into the actual molecule of DNA. We've learned about how uh, genes are inherited but now we're really going to look at what makes up a gene, what makes up DNA. And we're going to start with way back in the beginning. How do we even know that DNA is the heritable material? We've learned about all of their sorts of molecules this year. Proteins, um, fats, carbohydrates. Why is it that it's nucleic acids and how do we know that? Well, there were some famous experiments that we're going to talk a lot more about in class, but I'm just going to give you a very broad overview of these famous experiments. The first big one was in the early 1900s with a man named Frederick Griffith, and he worked with mice, and he worked with some bacteria as well. And he noticed that with these different types of bacteria he was using, he was noticing a change in the mice. And so he was wondering, what is causing this change? Something heritable is causing this change, and he didn't quite know what yet. Then, a little bit later, we had some more scientists that expands on Griffith's work, still using mice, and they thought they had isolated it. They said, it's DNA. But you know, scientists in the community were kind of a little skeptical. They thought, well, I'm not too sure about that. Let's do some more experiments. And it's good that, that, that scientists do that, right? So a few years later, uh, Hershey and Chase, two more scientists, did some more work, a different experiment using bacteriophage, which is a type of virus. And they came to the final conclusion that, yes, it is DNA that is the heritable factor. So now all the scientists in the community were just so excited to get to work on actually discovering what is DNA and what is its structure. How does it work? Um, so we're going to now look at what is the DNA structure. So DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And as we learned earlier in the year, we know the monomer is called a nucleotide. And one nucleotide contains a deoxyribose, which is a five-carbon sugar. It contains a phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. Now I do want you to remember that these first two are what make up the backbone of the DNA. And you'll see what I mean by that in a few slides. So this is an example of a nitrogenous split base. Please draw that in your notes and label it so that you know the three parts to a nucleotide. The four nucleotides, so there are four different nucleotides in DNA, and we'll learn that RNA has a small exception, but the four are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Now I do need you to know that adenine and guanine, they have these two rings. Notice that in their structure, it's these sort of two rings. We call these guys purines, and then cytosine and thymine, they only have one ring, and we call these guys pyrimidines. So please know A and G are purines, C and T are pyrimidines. Okay, now how do these nucleotides actually make up the structure? Well, another scientist called Erwin Chargoff, he discovered that when he was looking at DNA, the percent of G and the percent of C in any given molecule were always the same. Additionally, the percent of A and T in any DNA molecule he looked at, no matter what organism he was studying, a and T were always equal. So what this means, therefore, that G is always pairing with C because they're always in equal amounts, and as you guessed, A is always pairing with T because they are always in equal amounts. So this is really, really important when we're building this DNA ladder. G is always paired with C, and in fact, I do want you to know that there are three bonds in between G and C, and we're gonna learn that these are hydrogen bonds. So please write this down. These are hydrogen bonds, and there are three of them. In between A and T, there are only two hydrogen bonds. So please get that jotted down. So we wanted to start to really look at and see if we could isolate what DNA looks like. And there was another famous scientist. Her name was Rosalind Franklin. Uh, she was, I think, a biochemist. And she used a process called X-ray diffraction to actually try to see the structure of DNA. I'm not real sure on the details of this process, but this is the figure. This is the picture she actually took. And from this figure, I know we might not be able to tell, but other scientists said, yes, because of this sort of X shape, we know this molecule to be a double helix. So this was huge. So this photograph was given to two more scientists who you may have heard of, uh, James Watson and Francis Crick, and they took this photograph and they decided to just really put together an actual physical model in their lab about what this DNA molecule looks like. And so this is what they came up with, and I do want you to draw this in your notes. Maybe not every single line or detail, but I want you to understand this very important structure. So here is our sugar phosphate backbone. The P's are the phosphates, and then these five carbon structures, these are our sugars, our deoxyribose sugar. So we go phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and this is our backbone. Then what's in the middle, if you want to think of it as like the rungs in the ladder, 
these are our nitrogenous bases, our A, T, C's, and G's. So remember what I said, A and T hydrogen bond, and there are two hydrogen bonds. You can see that right there. And then uh, C and G are going to bond together, and there are three hydrogen bonds. So please get that as, as closely as perfect in your notes as you can so you understand the structure of this double helix. So that's what the double helix looks like. We can see that the backbone is the sugar phosphate backbone, and then in the middle there, those are our nitrogenous bases that are held together by hydrogen bonds. So yes, it is a double helix. Now I want to sort of jump back to earlier in the year when we talked about the cell cycle. This is sort of when we were first introduced to DNA. Remember that every cell cycle has a big phase called interphase, and then followed by mitosis, which is when the cells actually divide to create new cells. Remember we said that during a specific part of interphase, the DNA had to be duplicated, right? So that each new cell that forms from mitosis could get an entire copy of that uh, genome, of that DNA. Do you remember what phase of interphase it was? Well, hopefully you remember it was S phase, right? So we've got G1 and then S and then G2 and then mitosis. So we're going to really look at now what happens during that S phase. How is the DNA duplicating itself? We now have a lot of good information about DNA structure, so we can now start to visualize how it actually replicates and duplicates. So how does this actually happen? Well, I'm going to tell you. So as I go through, please, please draw these pictures in your notes, label the enzymes. You're going to want to have all of this in your notes. So what we have um, to start with is this is what we call our parent molecule. So this is what we see in G1 uh, of the cell cycle, the parent molecule. And it has two complementary strands of DNA like we just saw. A always pairs with T, C always pairs with G. That's what we mean by complementary. Um, C is complementary to G. Um, and A always pairs with T, G pairs with C. Okay, so now what we have to do first is we have to separate these two parent strands from each other. And it is the enzyme helicase that is unzipping or unwinding this DNA. So the two strands separate, and you do have to know it's helicase that is doing that. Okay, next, we're now going to add new nucleotides. Duh, right? We've got to uh, make sure that we add a T to pair with this A and a G to pair with this C. Um, and so now what we call this is we call each parent strand is acting as a template. Um, what do I mean by template? Think about that, and we'll talk about, it, about that in class. So it's a template asked to where this enzyme can add new nucleotides. And this enzyme is called DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase is adding the new nucleotides to the parent strand making that new complementary strand. And now there's one final step because what you notice here is these guys here, there's sort of a space here, right? We need to sort of seal that nick or, or sort of glue all of these new nucleotides together. And so that's the last step and the enzyme that does that is DNA ligase. DNA ligase seals all of these nicks together. So this now forms our new sugar phosphate backbone. So that's the bond that ligase is making, that sugar phosphate bond. And now what we see is that each new daughter uh, DNA molecule, so here's one molecule and here's the second molecule, and each one is composed of a parental strand in dark blue and a new strand in light blue. So that's all that we need to know so far about DNA and how DNA replicates itself. In further videos, we're going to look and see how DNA is sort of that template to make RNA and then how we use RNA to make protein. And remember, proteins are what makes us who we are. So we've got a lot more exciting uh, videos to come.